we'll start with Nietzsche before going into like where other people might take the same ideas. Sure. Uh, well, I just wanted to actually start by a quote from Nietzsche, uh, since Nietzsche, you know, writer that he is, uh, always expresses himself more eloquently than I or anyone else possibly could. This is from Twilight of the Idols, uh, where he says, the doctrine of equality, there is no poisonous poison anywhere, for it seems to be preached by justice itself, whereas it really is the termination of justice, equal to the equal, unequal to the unequal. That would be the true slogan of justice, and also its corollary, never make equal what is unequal. That this doctrine of equality was surrounded by such gruesome and bloody events that has given this modern idea par excellence a kind of glory and fiery aura so that the revolution, French Revolution is what he's referring to here, as a spectacle has seduced even the noblest spirits. In the end, that is no reason for expecting it anymore. Right? So very emphatic uh, in his anti-egalitarianism, which is a side to him uh, that's often been ignored uh, and has been for a long time. And I think there's good reason for this, because if you look at the kind of trajectory of Nietzsche interpretations, there's kind of three waves that we can talk about, right? Uh, one was an initial wave where he was very badly misinterpreted uh, by Nazis and fascists uh, as being kind of a proto-fascist figure, right? Mm -hmm. uh, arguing for the Superman who's going to lord it over other people. Uh, and he was interpreted this way, for instance, by Bertrand Russell, right? Where Bertrand Russell famously just denounced him uh, in his history of Western philosophy uh, and said, you know, Nietzsche's philosophy is pretty much garbage. Uh, it can be summarized by that one line in King Lear where he says, I shall do such terrible things as shall be the horror of the earth uh, or something to that effect, right? Um, and, you know, people like Walter Kaufman who kind of pioneered the second wave uh, of mm -hmm. Nietzsche interpretations really and very rightfully countered that, no, you know, Nietzsche is not a nationalist. He said they would never have gone in for the kind of biological racism endorsed by the Nazis. Uh, he was vehemently anti, uh, sorry, anti, anti-Semitic, right? Um, and he characterized himself as a good European in many instances, said some truly funny things about, you know, the noxiousness of German nationalism uh, and imperialism. So we had to put that to a side. And the way that uh, Kaufman and others at this period interpreted him uh, was kind of almost as an apolitical, not quite mm -hmm. apolitical, but mostly apolitical, bohemian intellectual, right? He had these interesting things to say about art. He was a critic of moralism. Uh, he had kind of these nasty barbs to strike against Christian conservatives in particular, right? Uh, and so in this way, you know, we could kind of recover what was interesting in Nietzsche uh, while dumping all these bad associations, right? And then there was a third wave uh, of Nietzsche's scholarship, if you want to call it that, really pioneered by left-wing post-structuralists in France, people like Michel Foucault, uh, who famously declared in the 1970s that he was a Nietzschean. You know, it's kind of ironic yeah. when you think that Jordan Peterson, you know, also likes Nietzsche, but called him like a postmodern neo-Marxist, right? Probably have a lot yeah, more to yeah, say yeah. to each other uh, if Peterson never actually read Foucault. Uh, but, you know, this kind of interpretation repoliticized Nietzsche, but in a much more radical and egalitarian way, uh, where they took a lot of the resources that were put forward in his book uh, to raise critiques of imperialist universalism, uh, various system, systems and structures of power, uh, and their association with various forms of knowledge. Uh, and all this was done for really radical purposes, right? To kind of emancipate people from ideology, discourse, uh, calcified ways of thinking, whatever you want to put it. Uh, yeah, you want to which, call which, it. Which, which, which I do, what I should say, uh, I remember, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I remember reading uh, a lot around the time that I think I had, like, I dropped out of college and I was about to come back and I yep. kind of decided I wanted to, I wanted to uh, to major in philosophy, and 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 so I was I was I was reading a lot of philosophy on my own, and um, uh, and and I remember uh, running in a little bit of some stuff because it was kind of like a popular level uh, version of of that third wave that you're just talking about. I remember mm -hmm. a book called What Nietzsche Really Said by Catherine right, right. Higgins and uh, and Robert Solomon, uh, which. Uh, you know, which I don't know. I remember being kind of excited to read because, like, whatever, it's about Nietzsche, so there's something sort of exciting and transgressive about it. And, oh, 100%, you know, yeah. it was, and it was, and it was like clearly written, and it was like continuing some of the Walter Kaufman esque stuff of like, you know, no, he wasn't an anti Semite, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, but then, like, also thinking back to it, it's like there's a lot of uh, very, um, you know, like people who are postmodernists. Um, reading back into to Nietzsche, uh, the way that like um, the way that like previously, I mean, you know, like Kaufman was interested in existentialism, and so so his Nietzsche is a proto existentialist, uh, and uh, he, he has a nice formulation about how Nietzsche wasn't an existentialist, but 
he is to existentialism, what like Aristotle is to Thomism, right? Aristotle is to yeah. Thomas, but, like you can't have Thomas without Aristotle. Uh, and uh, these guys want to make uh, Nietzsche a, uh, a postmodernist, you know, which is which is all over that book. You know, they talk about perspectivalism and things like that. And uh, it's which I also think is a little sketchy. Uh, like like now that I think back to it, because like a lot of that's based on like like the the thing that he wrote that's the most conducive to that reading is the on truth and lies and, and absolutely uh, non, yeah in a non moral sense. Which like it maybe is not insignificant that like hey here's a guy who was like beyond in love with his own writing. I mean he <laughs> he, he had uh, with good like, reason though. I mean no with good reason. I mean he's, he's like I'm, no I mean, he's totally one of the best writers in the history of philosophy. But like also um, but like also like he had one of the biggest egos in the history of philosophy uh, and. Uh, like there are literally chapters, like there's literally a chapter of uh, Eke Homo that is uh, is entitled "Why I Write Such Excellent Books," right? So this and is why I'm so wise. Why I'm a destiny, I think, was the most ostentatious <laughs> one, right? That's, that's right. So it's like this is a guy who wasn't suffering from any lack of self confidence, and he never actually tried to get this essay published. Like 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 that 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 maybe I think uh, militates against um, assigning it too much importance as like a sort of code key. For, for all this other stuff that he wrote where he's not saying things like that? Oh, 100%. Uh, I mean, it's an excellent essay, uh, sure. very provocative. What's remarkable about it is how little arguments are actually in the text. Um, mm -hmm. And this is very emblematic of Nietzsche's style where he doesn't actually really argue all that analytically for the positions mm -hmm. he takes. Uh, interestingly enough, the genealogy of morals, uh, which is probably his best well-known book, is an exception to that rule, right? And there are good reasons for this. You know, he was often sick. He had to write in these kind of short aphoristic bursts uh, and, you know, there's, and this is kind of what I was getting at also, uh, when he was arguing with people, uh, he, uh, or when he was criticizing people, he often took this kind of disdainful aesthetic approach. And I think there's reason for this. Uh, it's because you don't argue with the herd, right? right. Uh, you denounce the herd, you mock the herd, you denigrate the herd, uh, but you don't respond to their positions like they are worthy of actual argumentation, right? And this kind of brings me to the last stage of Nietzsche interpretation, because I grew up like you, uh, with a good postmodern Nietzsche, right? Deleuze mm -hmm. is Nietzsche, Foucault is Nietzsche, the critic of power Nietzsche. Uh, and coming from a Roman Catholic background, I found a lot liberating about reading mm -hmm. Beyond Good and Evil, Antichrist, forced me to think about things in a way I never did before. Uh, but, you know, my good friend Ronald Beener, uh, Professor Ronald Beener, he says, you know, you read these books and you see certain statements, uh, you know, about slaves, about violence. And if you're trained in this way to approach Nietzsche from a post-structuralist perspective, your eyes just kind of glaze over them and you don't really pay much attention to it. It's like, oh yeah, there he is mocking women again and saying, go without a woman, bring a stick, whatever, you know, just let's get to the good stuff, right? Uh, but the real effort made by people like Beener, like Malcolm Bull, uh, Nancy Love, and I should also say increasingly myself, because uh, this is what I intend to do in the anthology you're talking about, is to point out that no, you know, this really kind of neuters the anti-egalitarianism uh, of Nietzsche's thinking. Uh, and this is a real problem because in some senses, Nietzsche was the most profound uh, and vehement critic of modernist egalitarianism uh, that's emerged since the French Revolution, right? Uh, and what makes him so dangerous in many ways to something like the political left uh, is he doesn't rely on a lot of the old Thomistic or mm -hmm. Aristotelian uh, or Catholic arguments for inequality that were really popular. He acknowledges the problems of modernity, uh, he's not looking to return to some kind of utopian period beforehand uh, where we we're all good Christians and we accepted our place in some godly order. He develops a very original critique uh, of modernist egalitarianism that can appeal to secular people. In fact, it has primarily appealed to secular anti-egalitarian movements, right? Uh, and the argument people like Wiener and myself and Bull will make is that, look, absolutely he's not a Nazi and it's wrong to characterize him that way. Uh, if the Nazi movement had, would emerge and Nietzsche was still alive, uh, he would have been the first to mock them, right? But it's also important not just to sideline all this stuff and pretend like it was unimportant to him uh, because his critique of egalitarianism is absolutely central to his overall outlook. Uh, and this is where some of the stuff about resentiment comes in and why his ideas about resentiment have proven so palatable uh, to many on the political right. People like Jordan Peterson, uh, Richard Spencer, if you want to go to the far right, uh, the list goes on. Yeah, we, which, by the way, I remember there was an essay that was that uh, came out a few years ago. I think it was in like Salon or Slate or one of those places mm -hmm. by somebody who was in a um, German class. Like it was like a intensive summer German class in like Berlin or Vienna or someplace that kind of thing. 
uh, with Richard Spencer, uh, you know, years and years before anybody knew who he was. Uh, and, um, which was, which was, I don't know. I mean, the, the whole thing was kind of funny. You know, they said he was, he was a very good, uh, uh, he was a very good German student, but everybody in the class yeah. thought he was an asshole. Uh, and uh, <laughs> and, and, and uh, on uh, there was some deal where you could get extra credit, or I don't remember exactly how it worked. If you if you did like a presentation uh, in German on the last day on some like you know topic that you chose to like give a give like a little lecture about, and he wanted to do one about Nietzsche, and like apparently like the class mutinied. You know they didn't want to hear Richard Spencer, you know, talk about Nietzsche for half an hour. You know on the uh, on the last day, you know, which which is uh, something that makes me laugh every time I think about it. But yeah, right. So it's not a. Um, I mean, I think in in a sense, um, like you know when. Uh, you know, when Jordan Peterson uh, talks up Nietzsche or, or when some, I would argue, of the less perceptive left critics of Jordan Peterson talk up this connection, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, they, in a sense, like they, there's something very odd and like wrong about that because like, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, they have, I mean, if nothing else, they have very different attitudes towards Christian morality, right? But uh, at, but at the... Um, but there's a sense in which it makes sense and in which it also makes sense that Richard Spencer uh, would be into Nietzsche, not because um, not because Nietzsche was a Nazi or proto-Nazi. He most certainly was not. Uh, <laughs> you know, he, um, you know, he had uh, all of the sort of core Walter Kaufman points about the way that his his actually nazi sister you know sort of tried to yeah. distort, you know what he said or are all correct about that but uh what he's expressing is this sort of primordial anti-leftism and anti-egalitarianism that like you could see how that would viscerally appeal to in a way to like anybody anywhere on the right especially anybody anywhere on the right who wasn't just sort of um, interested in like appealing in a simple way to like tradition. You have been watching a free public preview for a patron exclusive episode. I'll give them an argument uh, to get the rest of this episode plus patron exclusive episodes every single Thursday, as well as patron exclusive post games after the regular show every Monday night and a lot more head over to patreon.com slash Ben Burgess. As a friend of mine used to put it, why be foolish?